He's told us that time and time again. You know, I, I wonder this morning if you come in here and you just, if you had to be just completely transparent, you would say, you know, Pastor, my relationship with God's just kind of really dry and dull and there's just really not much excitement to it, you know. Um, I would challenge you to think about something. Um, we talked about that this morning in Sunday school. We were looking at uh, the miracle of when Jesus healed the 10 lepers. And we were basically talking about the fact of how Jesus had told those men who basically cried out for his mercy, he told them, go show yourselves to the priest. And that was really absurd because the only time a leper would go show himself to the priest would be when he was clean. They weren't clean yet. So he told them to do that. They look at themselves and they're like, well, look, we're lepers. So the question was, they had to take what Jesus said seriously and here's the key they had to do it because it says as they went they were made clean and so the reality is for a lot of us and if I'm just being point blank honest we're not really buying what we're selling in this Christian thing we might profess it but are we really walking in it on a day-to-day -day basis like are we really taking what Jesus says seriously and seeking to walk in it because ladies and gentlemen that's where the excitement comes in is when you really begin to, to hear what Jesus says and walk in it. That's the excitement and the joy of it because you'll never obey him and do what he says and not experience in some way a miracle of God. It may just be the miracle of peace. You know, I'll tell you something. Yesterday, as we finished up our, our, my son, my youngest son's football season, we've had everything this entire season has gone wonderful. And all of a sudden, at the very end of the game, a parent wants to turn into a nut, okay? I'm sure y'all probably never seen this, but the reality is y'all probably been the nut. That's the thing, right? I know some of you have. I won't call any names, though, but we'll save that anyway. But, but here's the thing. All of a sudden, a parent wants to go ballistic, and I'm going to tell you something. The more this parent read, ran their mouth from the stands, I mean, my, my temperature, like, I don't even want to tell you what I was going through or what I was thinking at the time. You would be so ashamed that, I'm your, that I was your pastor thinking the things that I was thinking, right? But I'm telling you, in that moment, in that moment of time right there, you know, the enemy raised his ugly head. And, you know, it was like there was this war going on in my mind, this flesh that wanted to kind of raise up and just literally give everything I had to wring this parent's neck, right? Because here we have given all year long, all of our time for these kids in the rain doing this for them, you know, for the, for the sport, for, the, for all of those different reasons, right? And here's one parent who hadn't lifted a finger to do anything, and they figured it out. You know, and I did let him know that next year this is his. He can have it, Okay. Since he's figured it out, he can do it. But, but besides that, you know, there's this war going on. And you've been there, right? You've been there before. But grace, thank God for grace. Thank God for the times that we realize this is not the way God wants us to handle it. God has another plan. God has another plan for that. And just to tell you, I'm not going to get into all the details, but it's just amazing, just the little miracles you see when you, you choose to do what God says. I, so that my point is, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you might, if you, you were honest, man, my relationship with God is just real, no excitement, it's dry. But I want to ask you this morning, though, are you serious about what he says? And are you serious about doing what he says? I'm not talking about so that you can be saved or so that you can have eternal. No, I'm talking to you as a child of God. You know, are you, I'm talking to you as a child of God, like beyond this building, beyond just being here this morning. Does what he say matter to you? Does what he say something you want to walk in and do? So that leads me to the question I want to ask you this morning in the message. And you can go ahead if you would like and turn to 1 Thessalonians. For those of you, for those of you that may joining, be joining us for the first time in a while, we are walking uh, through the book that Paul wrote, the letter that he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, the first one. We're in chapter 2, so find that. But here's the question. If you like to take notes, this is really the title for the message. What type of believer gets the attention of the devil? 
What type of believer gets the attention of the devil? Paul did. Paul did. He had the devil's attention. As a matter of fact, Paul and the devil, they were on a first name basis. Here in this passage, and we're going to read it. I want you to see it. Let's look at it. And if when you found your place in 1 Thessalonians, or you can follow along on the screen, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 14, let's stand and let's make a statement that we are reading the very words of God and we want to honor and truly hear what he has to say to us through this. Because Paul, even being a man, the Bible says that these men were not just writing what they thought, they were being moved along by the Holy Spirit. And so what they were recording are the things that God wants us to know right now in our day, in, in, in 2021, okay, November. Paul told the church then, he says, For you, brethren, you became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. How bad was it? Well, they killed both the, the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Now, I'm interested today in today's society with all of these, these famous preachers, with all these huge followings. I want you to pay attention if you listen to them. How many times do they talk about the wrath of God? Because here's the reality. God talks about it a lot. So to God, it's a very real thing. Okay, it was really the whole point of Jesus coming in our place to take the wrath of God from us so that God could now extend life rather than death and, and wrath to you but we verse 17 brethren having been taking away taken away from you for a short time in present but not in heart we endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire therefore we wanted to come to you even I Paul time and again but look what it says but Satan hindered us Satan hindered us like for some reason, this guy Paul has the attention of Satan himself. Like remember, there are not many Satans. There's not many devils. There's one devil who's not omnipresent like God is. He cannot be everywhere at all times. So why in the world does, does Paul have the devil's attention? Why is he making it a priority to try to hinder what Paul's doing? That's interesting to me. Paul says in 19, for what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? And then he says, verse 20, for you are our glory and joy. You may be seated. So again, what type of believer gets the attention of the devil? Here in this passage, think about it. The devil himself is concerned with what is going on in the life of Paul. Why? I don't know if you ever see these movies. We know it is the same in real life. These, these crime organizations or these drug operations, they always have the big man at the top, right? I always have the big man at the top. You watch these movies and maybe a detective is now on the scene. But it's not just any detective. It's a detective like Liam Neeson or somebody like that right some really bad dude and so all of a sudden now it, it's not all of a sudden now the main guy at the top has gotten interested because this guy is no joke man he's he's making his way up he's ticked off for whatever reason maybe because of this drug operation somebody in his family's been killed or maybe you know how the movies are right but there's always somebody at the top the devil is at the top of this spiritual world of darkness this it is an organization and he has a lot of those under him but I'm telling you he is the one at the top of it all so why is it that Paul has his attention I can't help but think about Acts chapter 19 you can go home and read this but you'll find this little interesting story in verses 11 through 16 and it talks about the sons of Siva and all these guys are watching Paul run around and cast out all these demons and all these evil spirits. And he's doing it specifically in the name of Jesus, right? And so they're seeing it. Well, these guys decide one day, well, they're just going to invoke 
the name of Jesus like Paul in the life of this one that they've met that has an evil spirit. So they're like, in the name of Jesus. And so these guys, guess what? They cast out this evil spirit. This evil spirit comes out and it speaks. And you know what the evil spirit says? You can read it for yourself, Acts 19. Evil spirit says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, and I'll add a little bit of my vernacular to it. Who in the world are you? Because see, there's some people out there, man, they're getting after it. They're doing it, things in the name of Jesus, but the devil has no clue who they are. Matter of fact, he's really not interested in what they're doing at all. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that category. Now, some of you may may be like, well, I don't know. I kind of like life comfortable. I I don't want to really get the attention of the devil, right? I mean, I don't know where you're going with this preacher, but just bear with me. You see, there are a lot of us blaming the devil for things, but it's really not him personally. And I hate to bust your bubble, but are you really so much making an impact that the devil is really interested in what you're doing at all? I mean, that's a challenging question that I've had to ask myself for the last few weeks in looking at this. Does he really know who I am? Because there's a lot of us blaming the devil, but it's not really the devil. See, the devil, there's just one. He's not omnipresent. And a lot of what is going on for us that we blame on the devil is basically how the devil, the ruler of this world, has really just organized things so he can continue to keep people from God and lead them on a downward spiral to basically steal, kill, and destroy in their lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just Let's take, for example, just like pornography, for example. See, we we blame the devil like the devil is there in that moment, like leading us into that. No, it's the way he's designed things. It's the way he's organized stuff in this world system to try to bring you down. Does that make any sense? But a lot of us are saying, oh, the devil gave me a fit. Really? Did the devil really give you a fit? We can trace it back to him. But here's the thing. Is he really concerned with Matt Rummage? Is he really concerned with, with my life? Do you think he had a little bit of a part in what happened yesterday at the football field? I know what I kind of felt like I wanted to do. (laughs) Which would have kept me from being here with y'all today, actually. (laughs) I'd have been locked up and y'all would have been gathering, trying to figure out what in the world who was going to preach today and what we're going to do about a pastor. That's what you'd have been worried about. So why did the devil know Paul personally? What what kind of person gets his attention? Well, here, I'm going to give you the answer. You ready? I want you to really write this down. Because if you don't write it down, you're probably going to forget it. You can go back and listen to this later, but I really need you to remember this, okay? What's the answer? Who's the one that gets the attention of the devil himself? Who, Who gets the attention of the big man in charge of this evil system in this world? Here's the answer. It is the believer. It is the believer who seeks to fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us. It is the believer who seeks to fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us. We might think it's the guy or the gal or the young person that gets up every morning and says, oh, I'm going to try not to cuss today. <laughs> we think it would be that one, right? We, th- we, th- oh, you know, we think it would be the one that says, you know, all right, I'm going to be good to my spouse. I'm going to try my best to be nice, do something kind to them. And, and, and my kids, uh, when they act up or when they get crazy acting, you know what? I'm just going to not go crazy. We, we might think that's the one that the devil really wants to bring down. And again, I'm not saying he's not involved in some way. That's not the one devil's interested in. The devil is interested in the person, the believer, who says, you know what? Jesus gave us very strict and clear marching orders before he left. And that's what I'm going to devote my life to. So now here's the question. The question is, well, what is that mission? What is that assignment? Well, you've got to do me a favor. Look with me at Matthew 28 for a moment. I'm sure they can get that on the screen. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Well, 
Let's read it. You can just follow along with me. What does it say in Matthew 28, 19, and 20? The uniqueness of, of, of these verses is found at the end. That Jesus died, he was buried, he resurrected. And these are some of his final words before he ascends into heaven. Okay? So his disciples are together. Here's what he says. Go therefore and what? Make disciples. Of who? Of all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's the next verse? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, you read it with me. Does does Jesus seem to be confusing us? Or does he not seem very clear about what our assignment is now as the followers of Jesus. He, yes, he is very clear about it. Matter of fact, he repeats this in every gospel in some way, shape, or form. He repeats it in the beginning of the book of Acts in chapter 1 and verse 8. He says it over and over and over. And then he gives us the book of Acts and then the letters and all the examples of those original followers who lived this out. Just like Paul. So why did Paul have the attention of the big man himself? I mean, why literally is he experiencing like Satan has got involved and now he's doing everything to block his path to get back to these people? It's because he chose to give up his life and live for the mission that Jesus gave to his disciples. So let me just walk through a few important things about this. It starts with, if you'll go back to verse 19, it starts with go. And if you read that, you might would think, well, go is the main verb, but it's not the main verb. It could actually be translated in English like this. It could be translated as you are going. It's not the main verb. It's a supporting verb to the main verb. So as you are going, do what? Make disciples. Turn men into disciples. That is your main verb. That is the assignment. Everything else, going, teaching, baptizing, those are all supporting verbs for doing what God has called us to do. So go make disciples. Question, what is a disciple? I mean, if we're called to make something, what is a disciple? Well, on a general level, disciple is this. It's, well, first of all, let me say what it's not. It's not a convert or just a professing believer. It's not a convert or a professing believer. Salvation is the beginning. It's not the end. See, when you had a child, you brought them into the world, but that wasn't it. Amen? You probably wish that was it. But then you had a child in your hands. And then it was like, I got to raise this child. I got to raise them to maturity and I got to, got to help them to walk and to learn and to grow and learn how to learn and, and to educate themselves and to take care of themselves. That was just the beginning. So what is a disciple? A disciple is this in a general way. It is a committed, lifelong learner and follower. See, so you can be a disciple of a lot of things. We're talking about Jesus, so it means to be a committed, lifelong learner and follower of Jesus Christ. We're called to make disciples of Jesus. See, the goal is to make every believer look like and act like Jesus. The goal is to make every believer look and act like Jesus Christ. And what does that take? It takes a mission, a mission mindset that as you're going, as you're living your life, it doesn't say, y'all, even though I'm not criticizing being in a gathering like this, because we can, in a gathering like this, participate and be a part of making disciples. But the text says, as you are going, as you are living your life, as you're going to your homes, as you're interacting with your family, as you're on your job, as you're living your life, live with a mission mindset that we are to turn men into disciples as you're going. As you live every day, we have a mission. Penetrate the darkness. You are the light of the world. But Satan's substitute is, is that rather than go and tell, now he's turned it into come and hear. <laughs> now it's come and hear. And so we, we exert all of our energy. And I've been there. I did it for 10 years. We exert all of our energy. We want to get people in the pews. We want to get people here to come and hear when the goal is to take the people that we have, get them out there to go and tell. That's the Bible. 
You have a right to believe whatever you want, sir, ma'am. You can believe whatever you want about the mission, but that's the Bible. As you are going, believer, disciple, make disciples. That's what it says. He says, do it for all the nations. That's the world, every person. See, the reality is all lives matter to God. People get mad at you for saying that, right? Black lives matter, white lives, Hispanic, all those, they all matter. Every life matters to God. That's why he's told his body, I want you to go and make disciples of the whole world. So let me ask you something. I'm asking you as an individual, what is your vision and how big is your vision? How big is it? Is, Is it just your friends, your family, or just your neighbors, or is it really... See, God's heart is for the world, church. And anything less than having a vision for the world will not be accepted. Because when you choose God's strategy in making disciples, man, you can impact the world. Just like Paul was doing. What is your vision? How big is it? How do we do it we, as we do it? with a mission mindset every day as we go. We do it by baptizing them. When somebody, the Bible shows us this. We preach the gospel to them. They believe in the gospel. Then what do we do with them? First thing we do is what? We baptize. Philip with a eunuch out in the middle of the desert. I mean, God organized that. A divine appointment. The, the eunuch is reading from the book of Isaiah. He has no clue what he's reading. God sends Philip to tell him about what he's reading. He preaches Jesus from Isaiah 53. And as soon as he believes, what does he do? He's baptized. Right there in front of the whole caravan. What's the importance? Well, baptism is the enlistment. It's it's like the putting on of the uniform. You know, it's a symbol. It's a picture that the old life is gone. It's dead. It's done. And I've been raised to walk. In a new life. See, the devil tries to ruin our baptism because what what does he do? He tries to make it another hoop that you jump through to be saved. He does that. That's what he does. He's bad at that. He says baptizing them. But then he says teaching them. What are you teaching them? What Jesus says. Because what Jesus says is what? What can we count on from what God says, from what his son says? It will be true, right? Right? So what I'm saying is not what I think. It's not my opinion. I'm passing on what God says, what Jesus, his son said, and what he poured into his disciples as well. So we're teaching them all the things that he commanded, right? Go to that next verse. So in verse 20. And here's the beautiful thing. Jesus is going to be with us every step of the way. So, so here's the beautiful thing. Well, I'll say that in a minute, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Here's, here's the thing. Jesus is just looking for a body. He's just looking for a body. He's just looking for somebody to say, here I am. You can work through me. You can build your church through my life. Here I am. Have your will. Have your way. That, that's the mission. I, I did that very quickly, but, 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 but that's it. And who's going to get the devil's attention? It, it's not, and, and hear me out, it's not the church worker, 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 busy bee. Even though that's important, it has to be done because you can do all that but still be committed to fulfill the mission. It's not the person that sits in the pew every single week. It's not the person that gives over and above 10% of their income. I mean, even though those things are good, they're great, they support, keep doing it, doing it. But I'm just telling you, if that's it, the devil doesn't care. Matter of fact, he don't even know you. Because the only one that's ever going to get his, his attention is the one who takes very seriously in his own life to fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us. And it's our responsibility. It's not just, well, my role is to give. No, I mean, that's a part of it. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, your mission is to, as you go every day, I'm seeking to intentionally turn men into disciples. And I've been given everything I need right here in this book to do just that. If they're not saved, This truth right here will lead them into a saving relationship. If they are saved, I can take this word and I can show them God's heart, show them what God wants to do and instruct them now and how they are to live their lives. I can do that. Everything right here. It's a completely sufficient. We talked about that last week. The word of God makes you complete and equips you for every good work that you could deal with in this life. That's the mission. So let's ask ourselves, Matt Rummage, are you truly sold out and committed every day 
to fulfill the Great Commission? As you are going, are you seeking in your life to make disciples, to witness to the lost, to come alongside of believers and help them grow up to maturity and fruitfulness? Are, are we investing our lives in others the way that Paul did? We know that. That was Paul's commitment. We've been reading about that in 1 Thessalonians. Paul led these people to Christ, but he was also committed to getting back and seeing through the process. In 1 Thessalonians, we've learned that Paul said, relationship to these believers like a spiritual father and a spiritual mother I mean he's looking at these people even though some of them are probably older than him he's looking at them as his spiritual children that he has a responsibility to raise but the beauty that I love about Paul is Paul wasn't a one-man show how how many one-man shows do we see today I mean how many when you pull the pastor out of a situation everything just falls apart How many one-man shows do we have? Well, part of the problem is a lot of pastors who love the one-man show. They like being the man. They like being in charge. They like everything to depend on them. But that isn't the life that Jesus lived for us. Because thank God, see, the devil is not omnipresent. So if the devil's over here trying trying to hit Paul up and keep him from getting to the believers so that he can continue to establish them and grow them up, devil can only be in one place at one time. Here's the problem. Paul wasn't a one-man show. He had Timothy. And guess what? With Timothy, it was just as good as having another Paul. (laughs) So he just sends Timothy instead. And it was just as good as Paul showing up. Paul realized it wasn't just about getting people born into a spiritual world, but it was about seeing them to maturity and seeing them grow and be fruitful. 1 Thessalonians, when he sent Paul, look at chapter 3, when he sent, excuse me, when he sent Timothy, he sent him there, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to do what? To establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. The word establish means to turn in a certain direction, to get them too on that path of true hearing, the path of the mission as well. And so let me just throw this in. If Jesus was so clear and precise in giving us the mission, like if we hear that, just like with the ten lepers, Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests. If that's what he said and that's what he told us to do, and we continue to look at that and never do it, then what would have happened to the, to the lepers? Would they have been cleansed? Would Jesus have just said, well, they're not going to do what I said to do, but I'm just going to cleanse them anyway. No, 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 no. That's not the way it worked because guess what? One of the ten showed back up. And what did Jesus tell him? He told the one that showed back up. Well, you ask him a question first. Where's the others? But he told the one, he said, man, look, it is your faith that has made you well. It's your faith. that You taking that step of obedience and doing what I said, that's why the miracle showed up in your life and see that's why God gets all the glory anyway because God invites you just like to believe on Jesus how ridiculous is that like the world looks at that like you you believe in Jesus a guy that lived 2,000 years ago that died on a cross was buried and you believe he actually rose from the dead well yeah I do because the Bible's not just any book the Bible's a miracle book it's God's book and this is what he told us happened Now, does that eliminate people looking at you going, man, they're crazy. They're out of their mind for belief. No, it doesn't. But for us, man, we know it's leading to a glorious salvation for us from this world of sin that we live in. We know that. Paul's mission is to see people looking and acting like Jesus. He wasn't just trying to get notches in his belt. He wasn't just trying to get people to raise their hand or to walk an aisle so he could go on to the next place and say, hey, y'all, you'll never believe this, but, man, we had an awesome, powerful revival down there. We had 40 people raise their hands and pray the sinner's prayer. That's not what Paul was interested in. Paul was interested in the mission Jesus gave him, which was very clear, turn men into disciples. And I realize when you talk about that mission, some people are clueless. They, they, they struggle. They're like, what do we do? But, but, but here's the reality. Here's the hard part. When they start tasting of what it really requires, that's where people say, whoa, 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 whoa. 
I don't know if I want that. Because that means giving up everything. And that means I might actually get on a first name basis with the devil. Uh Uh-oh. Oh my goodness. I don't don't really want the devil to know my name. I kind of like being over here in the shadows. But I want you to see this before we close real quick. If you look at the text, you look at the opposition that rose against Paul. What was the opposition doing? Look at what it says in verse 16. This is, this is proof of what I'm showing you about the person that gets the devil's attention. Because what, what is the opposition trying to keep from happening? Verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. They're forbidding them to speak to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. And you can do this study on your own. Go back to the book of Acts. And I was just interested. I was kind of like, well, what, when, when, when the persecution hits, what is it that the enemy gets so upset about? Well, read Acts 4. And you'll find that what they're so upset about is that Paul and those, excuse me, that Peter and those guys at the time are preaching in the name of Jesus. It's all about the name, right? And Paul tells them why. Because that's the only name we can proclaim and people get saved. That's the only way the miracle can happen is when we preach Jesus. That's what Paul says. And so what did they do? They beat the fire out of them and they said very specifically, don't preach in the name of Jesus. So if all we've got to say as a church to people, have a blessed day, we will go unlisted on his list. He doesn't care about you. If you are not interested in proclaiming his his name in your everyday life, he is not interested in you. He would just assume you keep playing religious games. He doesn't bother you because the reason he's giving Paul a fit is because he knows what Paul's going to do when he comes into a town or a city or meets somebody. He's going to preach Jesus to them. He's not just going to say, hey, man, come to church with me, which, by the way, I don't want to encourage people to come, but that's not the mission Stop speaking in the name. Enemy knows, he understands. There's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. Paul in Romans 10 tells us, how in the world could they they call upon someone to be saved? How are they going to call upon the name of Jesus unless somebody goes to them and proclaims that? But not only did Paul, did did the enemy want to keep him from getting there, But when he went there, the enemy wanted to keep him from going back there. That's what we see in verse 18. We wanted to get back to you. We wanted to come, but Satan hindered us. Like literally, he threw everything he could at us, the whole kitchen sink, to try to literally, as the word would say, to break up the road, to put obstacles in our way. But ultimately, he couldn't. Again, because Paul wasn't a one-man show, because Timothy went. Okay, you're going to try to stop me? All right, Timothy, you go. But it just blows, that just blows me away. I've I've preached through 1 Thessalonians, I don't know how many times I've never seen this. I've never even paid attention, never, all my notes, never made a comment about this, that that Satan himself got involved. The big man. But the reality is he doesn't want the mission to be fulfilled because he knows the power of one man. And he knows, like, just looking at the life of Paul, how crazy and how out of control this thing can get with just one person who takes the mission of Jesus seriously. He doesn't want people running around looking and acting like Jesus. And I would say the early church did a fabulous job. Because you might think that the church got together early on and said, hey, what are we going to call ourselves? Well, let's take a vote. All right, you, you, you got a name. Well, we'll call ourselves Jesus Freaks. Eh, we don't like that. Somebody says, oh, we'll call ourselves Holy Rollers. Eh, we don't like that either, right? They didn't do that. Somebody didn't finally say, well, I, I like Christian. I like that. Okay, let's all vote. Everybody that's in favor of, 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 of Christian, let's raise our hands. Hallelujah. Oh, no, no. That didn't happen, okay? Here's what happened. The world 
looked at these disciples. And guess what? The world called them Christians. And you know what's so cool about this? Is the word Christian means little Christ. So like, did they do their job well? I'd say they did. Because it was the world that looked and said, oh, there's a little Jesus, little Jesus, little Jesus. These are Christians. Pretty amazing, is it not? What about today? Is that what your co-workers see? Is that what your family members see? They see a little Jesus? What are we fighting for, y'all? Hey, hey, just what are you fighting for? What's important to you? Is it really important to God? See, why would anybody sign up for this? Just look at the last two verses, we're done. Why would anybody sign up for this, Matt, knowing that you just said we might end up on a first-name basis with the devil himself? That's a mean dude. Like, I don't want to have anything to do. Like, like, why would anybody sign up for this? Look what he says in the last two verses. What is our hope? What is our joy or our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? See, here's the thing about Paul. He understands this world is not his home. He understands that there is a future day, one day, when he's going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. He realizes that. Paul, why do you keep going? Well, it's for them. It's for them. It's it's the people. See, Paul could see a present reward. A present reward. Because see, when Paul looked ahead, what he could see was the impact of those fully committed to follow Jesus and his mission. And it brought him great joy. Because he understood there was no way to measure the impact until the end of time. Because it would only be at the end of time that you would actually know how far the influence reached. Because you never know if you minister now to someone and make a disciple today, you'll never know till they die how many people they impacted. And you'll never know till all the other people that come in to the end of it all. The reach, the Paul could see that. He could see all the people gathered around the throne of God and worshiping in the presence of Jesus. He could see it all. And he's a man that could see beyond this temporary world. He's a man that could step outside of all the temptations and everything pulling us to hold on to this world. To see beyond into heaven, into the very throne of God, to what really matters. And how many people do you know like that today? I don't know very many. And we wonder why our relationship with God is so dead and so dry and so dull and without excitement in it. It's because Jesus said, go and make disciples. And we continue to hear it and we continue to make it our own thing. That's what we do. And we just assume that Jesus in the end is going to be proud. Remember the lepers. See, he could see the joy and experience that presently, but he could also see the joy of the future. See, church, here's the bottom line. This is why it's all worth it. Because it is the greatest joy when we as people choose to invest our life in others. Paul says in verse 20, you, you, emphatic emphasis, you are our glory and our joy. We have found our life in giving up our life for Jesus' life. There's a man who once said to me, he said, the most Christ-like you will ever be is when you give up your life to live your life through somebody else. Let me say that again. The most Christ-like you will ever be is when you give up your life to live your life through somebody else. Because that's what Jesus did. He didn't just say it. He lived it. He modeled it. And you and I are here today because he was faithful to do it. Jesus says, live for me. Take up my mission for your life. Yeah, you'll get the attention of the old devil. But you know what he says? God says, submit to me. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We have nothing to fear with him. Church, we have nothing to fear. He's a defeated foe. God help us. We are your people. We claim to be your people. 
And just like with those lepers, you said, do this. And they did it. And a miracle happened. Jesus, you have told your church, do this. What are we doing? And I'm, I'm asking this to individuals. Because I can only answer for myself. Lord, in the best way I, I know how, I have committed my life to that. The best way I know how at this point. Make me better. Grow me. Make me more fruitful. More committed to it. To give a living example to this body. Thank you for helping me stand firm. And not to buy into all the gimmicks and all the things that people are doing just to try to make themselves known or get another paycheck or to fill a, fill a room so that they can make a name for themselves. But God, may we stand firm on what you've called us to do, knowing the reality of your wrath that will come upon those who don't know you, who've never trusted you. Thank you so much for your grace, for our Savior. We renew our trust in him and in him alone because he is sufficient. And we ask it all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.